here in uh, Second Peter and what we were talking about. I felt like the Lord was um, trying to. Um, uh, the Lord is trying to prepare us and to say some things in advance and around of where we're heading with this whole little aspect that we're into right now, the historical and spiritual uh, progression of the house of God. Um, so I'd like to reread the beginning of the verse 12. Um, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and are established and are, and are established in the present truth. Yea, I think it fitting as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off my, this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath shown me. You know, that's, that's some really precious words, folks. This isn't just Bible, just words slapped down there. This was a man that loved God, and he loved the truth, and he loved the people of God, and he had a relationship with them, and that relationship was, yes, he was called to be an apostle. He was like a father. He was, um, and the wording throughout this is really, really tender, um, and intimate for these people. And he says, wherefore, I will not be negligent. That's, you know, sometimes we think, well, you've already shared this with me, or you've already said that, or, and I'm not just talking about from me up here. I'm talking about brothers and sisters, husbands and wives, um, children to parents or whatever. <clears throat> And maybe we don't always, for, for example, using a parent saying again to the children, maybe we don't always recognize what's at work. But what was at work in Peter and what's at, at work in many of us is that it, we would be negligent not to continually try to build up and, and, and um, uh, funnel towards the Lord and to stir up our hearts. My God, I mean, we can, you know, we can feed our minds. We can, you know, I mean, we got good teachers and good mind feeders here, but none of us want to feed minds. We want life and life begets life in that sense. Life begets life, you know. I mean, a truck can't beget a truck. <laughs> but a, a seal can beget a baby seal. Life begets life. And isn't it precious that kind begets kind? And, you know, I mean, that makes a difference, who we hang out, who we listen to, who puts us in remembrance. Because if we're listening to somebody that may be saying the right stuff, but they're, they're just an intellectual approach or, you know, just uh, dull or jaded or, you know... <clears throat> um, Kind begets kind. And so, uh, w you know, Paul talked about this, of, of finding those who are, you know, of the same kind that stir us up and that, that uh, feed us with the things that they're feeding on. Um, so, wherefore, I would not be negligent because he would consider it negligent not to love them. And he calls this loving them. I, wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. I, li I like this. Though you know them and are established in the present truth. He's saying you already know this and I'm telling you again and I don't think it's a bad thing. Because let's face it, <clears throat> a lot of the things that we have learned, we have let them slip or we forgot, or we, or the impact of it has left us. And hasn't there been a time when somebody has shared something you knew, but it was fresh and new, and it hit you between the eyes again, and you went, praise God. I mean, you felt that life coming back up instead of, you know, just a dull, you know, okay, I've got another shelf to put this on, you know. 
is that really what we want to do? And so, um, uh, even though he knows them, and that's, isn't that an interesting thing too, that he's, he's saying um, that you know this stuff. He's not saying, he's not sharing it because they're ignorant. So, so what is going on there? Well, he's fellowshipping. And I know a lot of teachers here can identify with that where you're sharing with people and you're not trying to, you're not trying to teach people. You're actually fellowshipping with the Lord and fellowshipping with those who are who are receiving, and, and it's just a beautiful thing. I mean, it's like an aroma that fills the room when you're part of that. And I know I've sat in many a class when I was in Bible school and years after that where someone would share, and I would feel like I had been brought into a banqueting table. You know what it says in Song of Solomon? He brought me into a banqueting table, not he brought me into a, you know, sterile classroom, you know. And I'm feasting with that person and, you know, and I, uh, Paul, uh, John said that. He said, I write unto you these things that you might have fellowship with us. Okay, so here it is. Here's, here's John, and here's those he wants to have fellowship with. I, I'm writing, or in the case of Peter, I'm speaking. Um, I'm, I write these things unto you that you might have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with God and his son. You see? And he's saying, we're being brought into what the father had, has with the son in terms of fellowship, and through Christ, you know, we're being brought in to this eternal reality that him and the father and the Holy Spirit are partakers of. This is eternal bread, you know, eternal, uh, you know, preciousness from the heart of God. So, uh, it just as I was sharing in the last class, those things began to touch my heart to realize, and then verse 13, yea, I think it fitting, <clears throat> as long as I am in this tabernacle, and he is, he uses that term in verse 13 and 14, and he makes it clear, because he's in verse 14, he says, knowing that I must shortly put off this, my tabernacle. Okay, so he's, he's calling putting off his tabernacle, his body. As if it were the house that he lived in. Um, and so, but he says, yet, yet, yea, I think it fitting as long as I'm in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Um, you know, I can see if the, after a while the group quit growing in Jerusalem and they all started being scattered and there was just a smaller group left there and Peter is feeling this way that he thinks it's, as long as he's got a body, he's gonna put them in remembrance of the Lord. Yes. And, uh, some of them are going, you know, well, I've heard that little phrase. Well, I've heard that thing. Well, you've said that a million times. But may the Lord feed us. May we not just hear words. Remember we talked about terminology. May we not just hear words. May we not just hear terminology. May we not just hear familiar phrases. May we open our hearts to the Lord in every class and every every opportunity to drink in the Lord instead of just attending something. And I'm not just talking about classes here or church here or I'm talking about anything that has to do with the Lord and many things that don't have to do with the Lord where you can still plug into the Lord. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I think it's fitting as long as I'm in this tabernacle to stir you up. Praise God. He's, he is, it's like a, a fire that that may be going down, and he's got his stick, and he's in there stirring it. So, have you ever seen that with a fireplace? You know, and it looks like it's going out, and it looks like the embers and everything are, are, are well, it's over with. You know, it's over with. The fire is gone. You know, 
and it's back up again, you know, because you get the ashes knocked off of you a little bit, and you get a little fresh air on the thing, stir it up, and that life of Jesus is incredible. In fact, I mean, I honestly, I came tonight in the promise and the spirit and the hope of Jesus when he said, out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. And I came tonight totally walking in that saying, I got nothing, Lord, but you are my life and you will not just be my life in general, theologically, you're my life. You are rivers within me and I, I am going to believe that that's what's going to come forth. And um, <clears throat> trust in the Lord every step of the way instead of getting bogged down in the mud and in the ruts. You know, the ruts are so bad, aren't they? Because you just stay in the same thing over and over, you know. Stir you up to break you out of that stuff and to put you in remembrance, to putting you back into remembrance. Um, <clears throat> knowing, this time this knowing isn't that they know something, but he does, knowing that I must put off this my tabernacle. Knowing that, um, you know, he's not going to be around forever. But as long as he is around, He's going to feed him Jesus. All right. Now, all that's great. All of that's wonderful. But the wording here in verse 12, wherefore I will not be negligent to put you in remembrance, here it comes, of these things. All right. Folks, we can make that little phrase of these things anything, but there's a context here. And the context is surrounding verse 4, by which are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises that by these you might be partaker of the divine nature. What is the divine nature? <clears throat> it's Christ. And, it's, uh, and, <clears throat> and he didn't say that you might be partakers of Christ the Savior. He's talking about Christ, the nature within us, because he's talking about us partaking, partaking. Man, that's the feast, and that's the, that's, you know, <clears throat> that is why Peter is talking about him as the tabernacle, because he's putting them in remembrance of Christ, the divine nature, as the life in him. You see that? It's the same theme. He hadn't left. I mean, we haven't left that theme, and it's the same exact theme. And uh, <clears throat> the three three things that are brought out in verse four, and I'm going to leave this real quick. But um, to have said everything I said and left out his words about to put you in remembrance of these things, the very things that we're talking about, the very things that he's been talking about, would be wrong. Uh, by which are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises. Okay. Uh, anybody know the song, the uh, hymn, Standing on the Promises of the Savior? Let's hear it on Skype. Standing on the promises. Let's do the chorus. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing. We're standing on the promises of God. All right, well, you need to get off of the promises. Quit standing on them and get them on the inside. <laughs> and... and and the way you do that is that this, the promises of God, this book, this reality, very precious promises begin to be assimilated into your being and you quit standing on them and it forms Christ and makes you a, a partaker of the divine nature. Now let's read it in light of that by which are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises that by these 
you might become partakers of the divine nature. That means that the scriptures turn into the word of God, the living word. Right? The scriptures are no longer just scriptures with promises that you stand on. They are that which gets broken down into meaning, not words, not just scriptures, meaning, and the meaning is Christ. And the meat of the reality is Christ that will be formed in you as a divine nature. And that's the work of, of God working his way through this progression. That's the end result is that Christ will be formed in us in a real way, in a meaningful way, meaning that the, the word of God, the scriptures, the all that is there <clears throat> no longer is just promises to your life. It becomes divine nature within you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay? And then the third aspect of verse 4 is partakers of the divine na nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. How do you escape the corruption that is in the world through lust? How do you do it? How do you do it? Somebody tell me. By being a partaker of the divine nature. How do you get the divine nature? By uh, studying and receiving these exceedingly great and precious promises by digesting them into life. The, the osmosis process where they're changed from one form to another, from scripture form to word, living word form. Well, how do you do that? The Pharisees didn't do it, did they? The Pharisees didn't do it. Let me ask you this. Did they have the same scriptures that Paul did? Yes. So what's the difference? What's the... What's the common denominator that's lacking. The common denominator that's lacking is most people are going to the scriptures to figure out their life, to get precious promises for their life, to get comfort for their life. And Paul went there to get the life of Christ. Amen. And he believed Jesus' words in John 5, 39. We, we mentioned it last couple of sessions. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Me what? Oh, I know the scriptures testify of Jesus as if he was a 2,000-year-old historical figure and we're reading about that Jesus. No, you will not come to me that you might have life. Jesus is referring to the scriptures, bringing them to him as their It's the, same, it, it's, it's the same exact process. And the end result of that is, the result of that is, that you escape the corruption that is in the world by what? By him making you stronger? No. By him being your life. I hear a faraway sound as if God were calling. <clears throat> Um, anyway, I just felt that uh, uh, there is that reality. And that, you know, let's, let's go to uh, John chapter 14. Now, I don't want to do too much in this 14th chapter because it's going to be one of the chapters that we really, really show uh, this, this reality, the fulfillment of what we're talking about here, the fulfillment of what the historical progression only pointed to in shadow form and the spiritual progression unto fulfillment because the incarnation of Christ is not the fulfillment. The tabernacle is not the fulfillment. The temple is. All right, but jumping over here because that's <clears throat> where we've been talking. <clears throat> um, uh, <clears throat> in verse 3, 
John 14, verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know in the way you know. So, so here he's talking about a being relationship, not a doing relationship. And most Christians only know a doing relationship for God instead of being by Christ. Okay, He says that that you may, let's, let's, let me just read it again here. Uh, I, go, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, okay, here it is, that where I am, notice that's being truth. You have to, you have to, you have to divide the Bible up into doing truth and being truth. But, do, but you, don't, you never pursue doing truth because doing truth is brought forth by being truth. Okay? That where I am, you may be, what's the word? Also. That where I am, you may be also. He wants, to, you know, we go, okay, well, you know, uh, he's going to prepare a place for us, and we're going to get all, you know, streets of gold and gates of pearl and all this kind of stuff. But if you listen to his words, even though the terminology seems to be pointing to uh, possessions and material things somehow in heaven, his terminology, because, you know, if you listen to Jesus and you only get the surface of what he says, you're going to be deceived. I'm serious. You listen carefully. When Jesus speaks, and, and that's, I take the word the same way. When, again, see the red letters? <laughs> you know, I know that's Jesus speaking. When Jesus is speaking, I figure, according to the scripture, it says, his ways are not our ways. And what is the rest of it? His, his thoughts are not our thoughts. And so I take that literally. I go, okay. I think this says so and so. So that probably ain't right. <laughs> I mean, if his thoughts are not my thoughts, I mean, would that be a proper assumption? And I tell you what, I'm just going to be honest with you, even in this tabernacle thing, and even in the, in the Gospel of John, as we get into this stuff, I am amazed at the true meaning as fulfilled as the fulfillment of the old covenant of what he's been bringing out to me and showing me things that seem so obviously one way. You listen, you look, you, you say, Lord, speak to me. Even while he's speaking, speak to me. I want to hear what you're saying. I don't want to hear you talk and me go away applying that to my way of thinking and assuming something that it may not lead me to. Does that, does that make sense? I mean, this, this is a, folks, this is a passion for God. This is not just uh, emotion. It's not just zeal. It's a passion for God. It has nothing to do with anybody else. It is your heart with God. And and honestly, in a place like this, you know, I, I you know, I think Doug would probably like to live down here, and Tony'd like to live down here. But honestly, in a place like this, it is so easy to fall into the um, party line, the basic teaching, the basic stuff. I think it's harder here than it would be away where you go. You go I gotta have the Lord. You know what I mean? And uh, because there, there are so many pitfalls to be able to fall into here, things that will rob you of your passion for Jesus above your, you know, all the things that, you know, that are Christianity, for lack of a better term. So uh, I'm, I'm just pointing out that Jesus is, is using, using being truth here, not doing truth. <clears throat> and where I go, you know, and the way you know. Okay, so <clears throat> he says, where I go, you know. And, and you know the way. 
And Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not where thou goest, and how can we know the way? <clears throat> ah, typical response. Number one, if Jesus says you know something, say, I do. Now, quicken me to really, how'd that go again? <laughs> Don't, don't refute Jesus. <laughs> I mean, really, come on. Does that make sense? You know? What was the one where, uh, oh, uh, oh, Jesus was talking about, well, I'm going to go to the cross and die. And, uh, and Peter said, you know, not so, Lord. Yeah. yeah, that's not really good. First of all, you don't use not so and Lord in the same sentence. Not so, Lord. Uh, if he's Lord, then so. <laughs> you know. <clears throat> um, but Thomas said, you know, okay, we don't know. We don't know the way. Folks, within you is the life of Christ. Within you is the Holy Spirit. You have all that, that you need. You really do. That's why it was interesting that the scripture says, out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. You know, I mean, <clears throat> we always see that as, as the, you know, that we don't see that. We, we want rain to fall from heaven. I was sharing that in Holland, how, um, you know, we want Pentecost. We want, and we're always doing this, oh, Lord. You know, we're dry. We need you. Fall on me. Bring something from above. Jesus said, out of your innermost being. And I noticed when I was looking at the, um, uh, Noah, because it says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the last days. And if we're in the last days, this would be the thing. It didn't just fall from heaven. It says, the, the fountain of the deeps broke up the earth and broke through. I'm going... Make it as this was in the days of Noah in me. Bring forth the life that you put in me, not just the, you know, let the spirit fall again and make me, you know, jump and dance. You know, well, that's fine, but, you know, this doesn't do a lot. I mean, it doesn't. You can, you can go uh, or fall down a roll or I don't know what all. You can do a bunch of stuff and still not really have the Lord. I mean, I remember one time that I was praying for people and, and God was doing a great work for all the people I prayed for and I was as empty and dry as anybody in that church. I, I know that I was more empty and I thought, God, why are you falling on them and blessing them? Hit me. You know, hit me with your best shot. And he's going, I already did. His name's Jesus, and I put him in you. I'm expecting you to trust in the, the fountain of living waters in you. I, these, my children, this is, the miracles is the children's bread. You're not supposed to be a child. You're supposed to be adult. You're supposed to be my son by Christ, and I expect you to act like it. Quit, you know, doing what they're doing and going, Lord, send something. He said, I've already sent something. My son, I've already sent something. My Holy Spirit. You have all and abound, Paul said. You know, I remember reading that going, no, I don't. Just like Thomas. Just like Thomas. Get in line with the word of God. Get in agreement with God. And if he says you know it, then just say, okay, well, Lord, you've, you sent the Holy Spirit to to remind me, bring to remembrance the things that you've said to me. I just, now how did that go again? And then you're in line with him and the Holy Spirit can show up. But if you're doubting the word of God, you're doubting what he's saying to you, I would say that's not a good thing. And then, then he says, uh, and how can we know the way? <clears throat> because... No matter how many times we've heard Jesus say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, we are still scratching around in the Bible trying to find the way that's going to work this thing. 
Instead of going, you are. That's a being thing. I am the word. I am the truth. I am the life. How do you deal with being truth? You deal with it by agreement. You deal with it by, by saying, okay, I, so that where I am, you may be. How are you going to get from you know, where you are to I am? By being one with the I am. Not trying to find the way, not trying to find the truth, not trying to find the life, but embracing God's word beyond miracles and blessings and precious promises. Because that's, I mean, you know, Thomas said, how can we know the way? He's looking at him. He's looking at him. But why is that ineffective in his life? Because he's not viewing himself in a being mode. He's viewing himself in a doing or a getting mode outside of the one that he's supposed to be one with. He's not embracing this being in union with Christ. In Christ. You know, the terminology in, the, in Ephesians is in Christ. But it's in union with Christ. And... You know, when you do that, what does that do? If you're a branch and you start believing into Jesus, and, and I'll tell you this right now, the word believe most of the time is actually translated to believe into. It is. It doesn't, it's not translated that way in our New Testament King James, but it is to believe into Jesus. Not just, you know, there's a difference, right? If I stood Jim up here and I said, Jim represents Jesus, and I said, okay, now, Jesus, I'm going to believe you. You can believe him and still, still have doubts. But if you believe into him, what happens? If you're a branch, then what, what is the life of the vine. Now listen carefully to that. The life that the vine has always lived by becomes the life the branch lives by. Well, what would that be? That would be the divine nature. Uh, or that would be the way and the truth and the life. He would be made unto me righteousness, redemption. He'd be made unto me all those things. He would become my peace instead of me trying to get peace from the Prince of Peace. You know, I mean, isn't that ridiculous? If the Prince of Peace is alive in me, why am I asking for peace? You know? Well, I'll tell you why. Because we're still separate and we're in a doing mode or a getting mode from Jesus because we have not embraced that God came down, that he initiated a new relationship, that he was up in heaven, now he's down here, and we'll explain all this a little further because we've jumped ahead just a little bit, but I think, I think it's important that we know where we're going to so that as we, we make the trek, we're going to be able to see this a little more. <clears throat> um, so... And how can we know the way? And Jesus saith unto him, I am. Okay? Remember that Jesus said that where I am you may be. So he says, because, because what is that saying? What, if Jesus says that to his bride, what is he saying? That where I am you may be. What does that mean? I'll tell you exactly what it means. It means I want you with me. I want you wrapped up in me. I want, I want a connection of oneness between us. I don't just want you over there wanting money for the grocer and uh, help getting the garbage out and da-da-da-da. You understand kind of what I'm saying? A doing thing will help me do that. Get into the being aspect of this so that when he says I am then you say well I am too not in myself you understand because 
Because in one sense, you really have no being. Your being is only found in him. Where do we get that from? In him we live and move and have our being. Isn't that Bible too? In him we live and move and have our being. Okay, what a strange phrase, and have our being. I mean, in him we live and move and love and dance and whatever. You know, we, that's where we would go. But the scripture says in him we live and move and have our being. In him is the life that we have. In him is the motivation, what moves us. And in him, my being is not about me. It's about Christ. And, it's about, and see, this is the stuff Paul uh, Peter wanted to bring them in remembrance to. See, though they knew it. <laughs> so I know that. But, hey, it's good to hear this again. It's good to be reminded of this again. <clears throat> All right, so Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. You could say it this way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. There is no relationship with the Father apart from oneness with Christ. So don't claim a Christianity that God has just somehow magically you were you me and all sinners were his enemies and now um, you know he's friendly all of a sudden he got over it he didn't get over it folks he didn't get over the fallen nature he didn't get over the the, the sins that we've committed he didn't he didn't get over the bad attitudes and the selfish ways of mankind he didn't get over it he'll never get over that what he did was he saw us join to Christ, and as long as we're one with Christ, it's okay. Because once the kingdom of heaven is like, we've said this several times recently, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed, who put leaven in, I forget how many, what lumps of whatever it was, and it grew and grew and grew till the whole thing was that way. All right? To stay focused on Christ, we are changed into that same image. That's how the change comes. All right, let me finish this. Next. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth. We're going to get into this later on, um, and we're going to see. We're going to see that their misconceptions of the history of Israel is what held them down and held them back because the shadows were what they thought was the truth, and. You know, this chapter will really break that up. For example, and I need to go over and finish this chart. For example, Abraham, Moses' tabernacle, child of David's tabernacle, Solomon's temple. So we say, okay, we point over here to Moses' tabernacle, and we say, well, that represents Jesus coming. All right, that, that sounds like what I've been saying, but it's not. That is saying... We're pointing to the shadow and saying that's where Jesus is the, <coughs> is the fulfillment of that so that I can wipe away <coughs> Moses' tabernacle. No. You don't even point to the timeline and history of Israel to see this because Jesus didn't fulfill it here Jesus fulfilled it with Israel on a completely different timeline, way down the line, when Jesus came. Are you following that? Way down, I'm just talking about the timeline now. We're just talking about moving along a timeline here. We, we point to this and we say Jesus fulfilled it there, but the fulfillment of that never happened in the wilderness. And in fact, that's a shadow of the wilderness and we're going to find out what the wilderness is. And the wilderness wasn't what happened way back here. 
That's a shadow of the wilderness. The wilderness is still around and there are still people wandering in the wilderness. The fulfillment comes all the way down the line, the historical line, literally thousands of years later when Christ is born and he's the, he's the tabernacle of God, the true tabernacle God what does he say next if you had known me you should have known my father and also from henceforth you know him and have seen him Philip saith, Lord show us the father it sufficeth us Jesus saith unto him have I been such a long time with you and yet thou hast not known me Philip he that hath seen me hath seen the father and how sayest thou show us the father he's declaring I am true fulfillment of the tabernacle of Moses. I am right now, whatever you, he, he can say this to the Jews, whatever you've experienced in the past, whatever you've known, you can't point to it, study it, play with it, examine it, divide it up. None of that is this. This is the real thing. It's just showed up. All of that was a shadow, a dark finger pointing thousands of years down the line and had nothing to do with all this that was going on here. And we're going to see that as we march through Israel's history and God's history timeline fulfilled spiritually. Okay? So, I guess I'm going to, I guess I should stop with that. Um, if just if you, you know, I know I'm, I'm, I'm hitting you with a lot here, but we're not, we haven't given the full explanation of everything. We're still just laying the groundwork, okay? All right. So, you know, don't feel like, well, I didn't get that or this or that or, and then it's going to be over with. No, <clears throat> we're going to, uh, and I want you to keep these charts, put it in your Bible, keep it because we're going to have to refer to it uh, next couple of classes for sure. We've got a lot of ground here left to cover in relationship to the spiritual reality. And I, I just want to tell you that this, um, this Shiloh, this taking of the ark thing, I mean, I got goosebumps. I mean, this is incredibly powerful, the reality that is behind that. And that was a, just a shadow, and it had nothing. The, f the true shadow of it begins to be fu fulfilled early in the Gospel of John. We begin to, we'll, we'll examine it and we'll look at it. And there we're going to look at scriptures that we clearly have read wrong and didn't hear Jesus and him give the explanation of, guess what? You know, it's like he's pointing back here and saying, guess what? <clears throat> you only saw the shadow. And anytime you look at a shadow, folks, I'm ending with this. Anytime you look at a shadow, you miss a whole lot of points. Are you with me? <laughs> you miss a whole lot of detail and stuff. You can see a, a silhouette of a person's head turned sideways and then see them in real life and go, well, that's completely different than what I thought. And uh, so... Uh, I just ask you to be in prayer over, over this class and things because the Lord is um, really, I mean, again, we're just starting and we're just getting to the point where um, we're going to be able to open some things up. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your son. And <clears throat> Lord, we ask that, um, that you will guide this class Make it more than a class. Make it a place where we gather and we make an altar where we are. And we say, open your word and open your heart. Lay forth things that I knew not. Show me beyond the shadows. And Lord, Help us to stop pointing to the shadow as if that's it and explaining Jesus by the shadow. Because the shadow is not the true picture and it is, it'll get us off track. 
Help us to see Christ in his true fulfillment all the way. We look to you. We trust in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're dismissed.